Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Hope you had a nice lunch. Um, I've only got 25 minutes, so I better crack on. Developer experience and the low-code paradox. So I'm the uh, low-code skeptic at a low-code conference, so we'll see how this goes. Um, but yeah, our focus is really about software developers. My company spent its time trying to understand the decisions software developers make and the impact that has in terms of IT in general. Now, Monk Chips is, is my uh, Twitter handle, so if any of you are frantically tweeting about uh, your outrage at his perspective on low-code, that's fine. Um, content thrives on two main things in the world. One is outrage, the other is confirmation bias. So hopefully, I'll give you a bit of both. The New Kingmakers. Um, this is a book that my colleague Stephen wrote a few years back. I, I think we presaged some changes in the industry. We sort of identified some things that we, we were going to see. Luckily enough, we were right. The idea being that de software developers and, and development became far more important as we tried to get competitive advantage from the digital services that we were building. It became clear that we couldn't buy everything as packaged applications and get the kinds of advantages we needed to. It became clear that competing in the marketplace, we had these well-funded, VC-funded companies building these amazing digital experiences that we all think about, wasn't really going to cut it. When you're competing with Amazon, you'd better get good at software. So a good example would be a company like Target. Target in the US, it's a retailer, and they used to have um, a percentage of, they would have 70% uh, external contractors and 30% internal software developers and IT people. They realized if they wanted to compete, if they wanted to compete with Amazon, they were going to have to change it up. Over the course of two or three years, they invested in DevOps skills, they invested in agile development, and they went to 80-20, 80, 80 internal, 20 external contractors. And so if you think they did that as a retailer in order to better compete with Amazon, well, it was pretty lucky if you think when the pandemic hit and they needed to make a lot of application changes, they were ready for that. So Amazon had kind of been a, a personal trainer for the retail businesses. But basically, when we looked at Apple, when we look at the sort of the revolutions we've had in terms of our expectations, in terms of software, in terms of the experience, in terms of mobile devices and so on, yeah, the game had changed. We needed to invest in developers. Speed, speed is of the essence. We heard that this morning, everyone wants to move faster. I think one of the really impressive things in those talks is that indeed, people are moving faster. We've got cement companies shipping multiple new applications over the course of just a few months. So Tesla is an amazing uh, case study. Everybody wants to move faster, we're all under a lot of pressure. We've got all of these new competitors, as I say. DORA, the DevOps Research um, and Assessment, is an interesting piece of work. Um, it, it came out of the, the DevOps group. Dr. Nicole Forsgren um, did, did most of the research. And I think it's really interesting because it identifies something key about moving quickly. You've all heard that, that sort of awful uh, phrase from Mark, Zuck Mark Zuckerberg, which is move fast and break things. Um, that was fine until he broke democracy, but we'll not go <laughs> too, too far into politics. But yeah, sometimes it pays to, to think about the quality of what you're doing. What's really interesting is we assume that if you're moving faster, making many more changes, you're going to have more breakages. But what we've actually seen from the elite performers, what we've seen from companies that have invested heavily in better software development processes, investing in, in people, that actually they're moving faster and having fewer outages. They're doing more testing. They've taken on a whole set of practices which has enabled them to move fast and not break things. Because the last thing you want to have is turning on the TV and Netflix isn't working, right? Sometimes it, sometimes it goes wrong. Uh, there was an outage from a company called Cloudflare this morning, put half the internet out, but, but, but there you go. So when we look at the numbers, oh yeah, there's all these software developers. It's amazing. Holger's wrong. There's not only 30 million. Look, there's 56 million users on GitHub, and there are plenty of developers that aren't, aren't, aren't really using GitHub. GitHub is an interesting proxy today for modern software development. But obviously, people have multiple accounts. Uh, some of the people are there, there are perhaps designers, they're doing documentation, they're not all developers. Um, and, 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 and we don't, as Holger says, have a very clear view of how many developers there are in the world. But what we do know is that there are not enough. When we look at the numbers, um, you know, this is, this is US, but we've seen the same sorts of, of, of patterns in Europe. 
it's become harder and harder to hire good people. Some of that is there are these, these competitors. I mean, we've, we've thrown away a lot of VC money over the last few years on some bad ideas. Um, some of them have been good ideas, but certainly wage inflation in Europe for good software developers, um, over the last five years even, we've perhaps seen, in some cases, people doubling salaries. And the idea that we're going to be paying software engineers north of 200,000 euros or something, that's not an expectation the enterprise had, and it's certainly not an expectation that the enterprise has now. So what are we going to do? If the people are so expensive, what's the solution? We do want to invest in developers, though. If we think about Twilio, um, uh, it's, it's a very powerful service. It just enables you to quickly, with an API, send SMS messages. Very, very, very useful in, in terms of communication. Jeff Lawson wrote a book, a bit like the New Kingmakers, saying that the people that are really important to you in building an interesting business proposition are developers. Get the developers close to the business. We heard some of that this morning. Let's get developer closer to the business so that we can get better business results. I mean, it really pays to, to be thinking about their needs because they're the ones that are going to give you competitive advantage. Um, but there's a challenge, which is managing all this stuff. How are we going to manage all this stuff? Holger talked about software is eating the world. A brilliant statement, great essay. It's, it's, it's driven a lot of change in terms of, of the way organizations work. We go a bit further, and we think that managed services are eating the world. So increasingly today, it's about cloud-based services, because you don't want to have to manage all of this stuff yourself. A lot of the transformation we're seeing is because of the increasing use of the cloud in deliver well, as, as SaaS-based services, either for software developers or indeed for individuals. And I think one of the things about this is it's about permission. Cloud-based services, generally, you're not having to go through the kinds of hoops that you traditionally have. Not so long ago, you could go into an organization and they actually say, we have no cloud. We don't use the cloud. And you're like, oh, OK. And then you go and talk to their salespeople, and they're like, yeah, we all use salesforce.com. They were all using the cloud already. Now, with the pandemic, this has had an acceleration. My sister-in-law works at um, Microsoft. She lives in Munich. And the expression she used, and we think of, we think of, of Germany as a nation in terms of, of uh, adoption of cloud services as a bit slower, a bit more staid. <laughs> bit, but, you know, there's a bit privacy concerns. We're not really ready for the cloud. Microsoft's experience, she said, the pandemic was shoveling workloads into the cloud. So that was a big change we've seen in the last couple of years. Oh, that bottle of wine looks so good, doesn't it? <laughs> so one of the things we've got is this new kingmakers, golden era for developers. We've got all of these new cool tools for them. We've got uh, open source has been absolutely revolutionary. Again, no need to ask for permission. People are building all of these amazing tools. Go to GitHub find something interesting, spin up an Amazon Web Services instance, get your credit card out, get your boss's credit card out, and you can be building a new application. You can be doing machine learning. You can do all of this stuff. But previously, it required a lot of purchasing, and it was a much slower process. So that's the good news. The bad news is there are all of these tools that people choose, and they go and choose them, and they build these things, and somebody has to maintain it. So if you think about the, you know, Hadoop popped up. Oh, oh, everything is going to be Hadoop. And then it was like, we can't manage Hadoop. So Hadoop sort of you know, began to, to die off. There was just too much complexity. The Elastic Stack, oh, it's brilliant. It's open source. We can build monitoring. We can build this new search um, experience for managing our applications. And then suddenly you've got 30 or 40 people managing that. And that's not really what we're looking to do. So we, we live in an era now where there, there, there's a, choice anxiety, there's an organizational overhead, and there's an individual overhead, because the developer is like, wait, I thought I was building an app, and now I'm having to manage all this infrastructure, and frankly, it sucks. Ah, oh, puppies, so nice, right? <laughs> Who doesn't love a puppy? On the other hand, someone has to clean up after the puppy, right? <laughs> and, and so, you know, this is the software developer. It's, it's beautiful, but, you know, they're leaving a mess behind them. Um, I have a cat, different set of messes, but some of the same things. You know, the kids love the cat, love the cat. They're not the ones that clean the litter tray. So, you know, these things have, a, have, these things have, have an overhead. Things need to be managed, things need to be looked after. So developer aesthetic, you know, we're going to try and appeal to these developers, these new kingmakers. 
And you know, it's, it's uh, sorry, uh, developer experience. It, it can be a head scratcher for the developer. So let's think about the developer aesthetic. What do they want? What are their expectations? First thing, dark mode. It's got to be dark mode, software developers. <laughs> I'm sure that's, um, you know. <laughs> So this is going to be a requirement. I don't know yet whether we have application builder with dark mode. Yes. Yay, dark mode. OK, good. So developers will be happy. We're addressing the developer experience with Neptune software. But there are these things they expect. You know, we expect some cutesy stuff. You know, it's the old, the old uh, Docker whale, or you know, we've got the, the, the Octocat from, from GitHub. Um, Services like NPM. Developers have got all of this stuff that they can grab. Um, they expect it to be really easy. You know, it's just a, it, 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 this goes back the, 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 from, from Linux. When we, at the moment we had apt-get, sudo install, you just had all of the packages that you needed in order to start doing application building. So we're constantly moving forward in terms of better developer experience. Right. One of the problems that we had is monoliths. We built these monoliths. We could build them quickly. This is a good thing. We built an application. We, 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 we're, we're ready to go. It's going to serve the customer for the next how long? Two years? These days, that's not acceptable. We've said we have to move quickly. We've got organizations you know, like the ones we've heard from this morning that are shipping multiple applications. And from that perspective, you want to start breaking things into smaller pieces. So the, the, the monoliths of old have gone to uh, microservices and composite applications. We want to build small things pull them together. And certainly, the age of, I'm going to rely on SAP to do everything for me, are long behind us. We all know how long the upgrade cycles were. We all know, I mean, customization. Customization is a word. It sounds good, and yet, in the SAP ecosystem, we all knew what that meant. It meant a lot of cost for us. It meant a lot of technical debt. Now, microservices are great, except it's yet another way of creating complexity. We're like, oh, let's not use that monolith. It's, Oh, no, this is, this is Uber's um, microservice graph. And uh, well, I don't understand it. <laughs> but, but the fact is that, that they have built all of these composite services with individual teams all working together to deliver that user experience um, for, for um, their customers. And let's talk about um, programming uh, languages, I think. I want to make a, a bit of a shift here. We run a, a regular um, a study. Uh, where we look at the most popular programming language rankings. And I'm sure some of you out there are all saying, yeah, but where is ABAP? <laughs> is that it? <laughs> See, I, I thought, in fact, I thought ABAP wasn't on here. Where are we? Uh, So that's actually surprising. Here's me building my own slides. I'm like, because ABAP is not in the open source world. And this is, you know, the, 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 the charts here that will benefit, it's we look at GitHub, we look at Stack Overflow, and that honestly is funny, because I, I, as far as I was concerned, ABAP was not here. <laughs> so we're looking at behavior in GitHub, and we're looking at conversations in Stack Overflow. It's a forward-looking view. Um, but what we see is JavaScript is, is crushing it. And then you've got Python and Java. So over time, we've seen this pattern. I think there are some interesting things happening here. JavaScript is clearly something you want to invest in. TypeScript, superset of that. These are very good languages in terms of, of enterprise adoption now. We've seen it across the board. Young developers today are all using JavaScript. So in terms of the choices you want to make in being able to suit developer needs, JavaScript is what you want to invest in. Uh, Holger talked a bit this morning about um, uh, machine learning. One of the reasons that Python is doing so well is because it is one of the languages of machine learning. It's general purpose, but it is very, very useful. Look at a company like Spotify. They use it extensively for that purpose. Java is dead, again. It's, Java's always dead, except it never is. We've been doing this a long time. Java just continues. It's, it's unkillable. It is the zombie programming language. Um, but, but, but I think in terms of the, the choices that developers are making, what's interesting is there is some stability. Sometimes something new pops up. Um, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll see a lot of activity around Kotlin or um, uh, uh, Dart. And, but, but the truth is, is that in terms of the bets that we make, it really makes sense to suit what developers are doing, and these are choices they're making. We see interesting new technologies. So this morning, it was all about REST interfaces. GraphQL is one of the considerations now. 
a lot of, a, a lot of developers now expect GraphQL. So I think that's one of the conversations I'll, I'll be having with Neptune around GraphQL support. React, as a framework, huge adoption. So I said JavaScript. React is absolutely the framework for front-end adoption in the enterprise. Let's talk a bit about Kubernetes. So I talked about managed services, and that's what we heard from Blueberry earlier, right? It's like they didn't want to manage all the Kubernetes themselves. Let's do it in the cloud. Let's do it with, with Azure. Let's do it with their managed um, Kubernetes service. So Kubernetes, whether or not it's a good idea, I laugh at Kubernetes because it's, it's so many enterprises who all said, we're not going to go on massive projects, 10 million pounds, 10 years. We're not going to go on these huge projects. We're not going to rebuild everything. We're going to use small cloud services. That's the way we're going to do things. And then I'm like, well, why have you got a chief Kubernetes officer? Which is not strictly true. They don't really have a CKO. But they basically, they're investing huge amounts of money in platforms that are, what's it for? Well, for containers. And what's that for? For applications. Do you know how to fill the clusters? No. Lots and lots of companies have invested huge amounts of money in Red Hat, OpenShift. And now they're like, well, we bought Kubernetes, but we don't know what to do with it. There is a skills gap. And I think that's what we're talking about today, is this, this gap between, yes, we want to enable developers, but there's always a gap in skills to get from A to B. And Kubernetes is very, very complicated. This is the, uh, the, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation landscape. The only thing I've ever seen more complicated than that is a diagram I once saw of the COVID virus. <laughs> um, they are both equally <laughs> scary. OK, so th there's waves of, of things breaking across us. So cloud native um, technology, uh, you know, edge computing. We've got new platforms there. We've got things like Netlify, Versal, lots and lots of things that we might consider. Lots and lots of change, lots and lots of complexity. One of the things I think is interesting about thinking about low code is, it, is, is, is you know, from a Peter Pan perspective, J.M. Barry said, all of this has happened before, and it will all happen again. Now, some of you might not like Peter Pan. That's fine. I got you. Battlestar Galactica, same thing. All of this has happened before, and it will all happen again. And in fact, if you're a classicist and you don't like that, it originally came from Ecclesiastes. The fact is, your biggest competitor for a lot of software companies is a spreadsheet. <laughs> and this morning I learned it's not just a spreadsheet, it's paper-based processes. It's so easy to get carried away. Oh, all well, the digital stuff is done. We've like really moved far ahead. But actually, those paper-based processes need changing. But every software company is out there. Actually, it's spreadsheets. Situational applications. And that's kind of one of the areas that Neptune is focusing on building these applications, right? It's a small thing. Well, not, I mean, I guess explosives management isn't exactly a small thing. <laughs> kind of important, kind of important. But it's, 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 a, it's a very specific application for a specific purpose. And, and you know, we, we've seen this before. 1989, there's a plat platform Lotus Notes. You had all people in these different organizations, and they were building applications. They were building business applications. You'd be in publishing, and suddenly you find, I mean, well, actually, you'd be Deloitte. Deloitte was building applications on Lotus Notes back then, right? be a publishing house, and be like, hey, we can move these media content objects around the place with, with Lotus Notes. 1991, Visual Basic comes out. And suddenly, it's like, hey, look, we can draw this thing. We can draw a form. And suddenly, we're going to have an application. This sounds like low code, right? This is nothing new. Uh, Bola Ratibi is here. Yesterday, she mentioned the 4GL and case tools. Any, anyone here got the ugly scars from 4GLs and case tools? Anyone? Anyone? A couple of you. So, so basically, it was the, 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 the you know, and, and access. Ah, now, now I got you, right? So situational applications, this is nothing new. Low code, in a sense, is nothing new. Um, so I'm just going to fast forward a bit. We're going to fast forward, so low code is nothing new. Where are we now? We've got a few different models for low code. Um, one of them would be spreadsheets on steroids. And it's things like Airtable. For people that have a spreadsheet brain, that's amazing. Like, I'm going to turn everything into a spreadsheet with some integration and so on. Some really interesting um, applications there. But you're not, it's not something that you're going to be building like mobile apps with. The Product Hunt generation. You know, Product Hunt is this interesting platform. There are all these cool tools that you can use there. People go out and it's like, oh, there's a new one. We're going to use Monday now, and it's going to manage all of our our processes, or, oh, no, we're going to use 
Notion, and it's going to help us manage all of our projects. And every six months, they want to change their tool, and there's some great references. That's fine for these startups. They don't have any legacy at all. And then we have this question about low code and no code. So um, the, the, the platforms are becoming uh, increasingly powerful. Um, no code definitely is a thing. Uh, the idea, look, I mean, developers, are, there's not just one kind of developer. The plot I showed of the programming languages, an ABAP developer is not the same as a React developer. We know that. So how do we bridge that? Could we take the ABAP stuff, make it, point at it, click on something, and have something the React developer could use? That's the sort of model that we want to have. Low code, and, and now we're beginning to say, maybe it's just yes code. We can have it. The problem is, again, it's a mess. This isn't quite as bad as the puppy mess, perhaps, but it's another mess, right? You give people the ability to build all of these apps. At some point, you're going to hand them over to IT and say, thanks, can you just can you take this over now? It's got a little bit complicated. Somebody's left holding the puppy, the baby. Somebody's left having to look after this thing, clearing up the mess. And I think that's one of the things from, from the developers I speak to. That's why they don't want to hear about low code. They think it's lowest common denominator. They think that it's not going to be as compelling an app. And what will happen is the users will begin to like it, and then they're going to have to maintain it or build a new thing. That's their skepticism. But of course, for all the fact that developers are in this you know, uh, strong position, the organization is there are these overheads. You're one of them. So here we go. It's, it's about a spectrum. There is going to be a spectrum in terms of the choices that developers make, in build, uh, that organizations make, in delivering applications and services to their end users. Um, and, and, and that spectrum is partly because all the different kinds of platforms that we're going to have. They might be pure API platforms. You know, it's going to be Algolia. It's text search. That's great. We don't have to worry about it. Stripe, payments, that's done. Um, Cloudinary for content management, for images. We've got the, the cloud platforms in the middle. Of course, SAP continues to be there. We've got the, the, the legacy ERP. And basically, in an environment where there is all this need for integration, it's going to be API-driven, but there's still a lot of work to be done. Yeah, the, the, the truth is we're going to need a range of tools in order to make more and more people productive. And they're not all going to be professional developers. It's about jobs to be done. When I look at the iPhone, it's this sort of moment when Apple pulled everything together in such a way, such a phenomenal packaging exercise in terms of making things, that, making a platform that could be immensely productive for people. And think about all the things that have gone away, keys, wallets, rulers, uh, you know, all sorts of things we no longer need. And in fact, Apple then, we have to compete with them too. If you're in healthcare, oh no, Apple is coming. I'm in banking, I wake up one morning and they have a banking card. You know, I'm, I'm in payday loans, which suck, and you shouldn't be in that business. But if you are, Apple turns around and like, oh, we're going to make it easy for you to pay in two weeks for this thing. So they took those, those things and made them part of the platform. The cloud takes jobs to be done and makes them part of the platform. So that how do we make people productive? One of the companies we look at in this regard is Spotify. And, and I think they're interesting because... Their question is all about how do they make their people productive? Because that's, you know, whether or not it's low code, no code, how do we make people productive? They talk about golden paths. They have a portal, the same as we were talking about this morning. You know, every developer goes into work, they arrive, there's a portal there. If they want to spin up containers, they do it through the portal. If they want to kick off a, um, a continuous integration job, they do it through the portal. They've tried to make everything packaged and easy for the end user. And really, you know, regardless of what we call this, in my world, we call it platform engineering. But it's just really about that spectrum. And how do we bring together the different constituencies? How can we enable more effective collaboration between developers, between user experience designers, between business people, uh, between those, those, you know, there are some, some, you know, there are some business people out there who are like every day building interesting and useful applications. New key makers or not, that's just the truth. So what we're trying to do is think about how do we mine the gap, right? How do we get over this gap, this developer experience gap, but also this human experience gap, so that we communicate more effectively. Um, Amazing, amazing talk about that from Dustman this morning. That was amazing. In fact, can we, should we get another, another round of applause for Dustman's talk this morning? Amazing, amazing talk about collaborating uh, more effectively, different groups. Now, where are we? 
There are only two ways to make money in business. One is to bundle, and the other is to unbundle. Now, from a Neptune perspective, they're trying to bundle an experience, bring some things together to make things more effective for a particular set of users. They're obviously, at the same time, trying to unbundle SAP. They're making it easier for the user to get more, more advantage. So bundling and unbundling. Let's focus on, on doing one thing really well, or else we're going to do everything and maybe not do it quite as well. The truth is, it is the age of platforms. We can follow the yellow brick road, but it's all about communication. That's what I loved about what I heard this morning, because the key word again and again was working together, collaborating effectively. And it doesn't matter whether it's, it's um, it doesn't matter who the people are. They have to work together. Thank you. Thank you, Tim.